So let me welcome you to our one of our sessions, our online mentoring sessions. And today it's about psychology and our guest is John Island. He, he's a psychologist, organizational psychologist. And uh, I just asked him to tell us a bit how, how kind of our operating system of humans could work. And I think that for Music Build, the Green European Opera, it's important because we want to create a, a new experience for, for our audience and knowing how humans work, how we, how we function, not only on the intuitive level, but also maybe with some psychological background might help us. We, we don't know actually, but that's why we are meeting today. John, uh, John will introduce us to some, to, to his side, not his ideas, actually what science says and what he interprets with that. Uh, he helps a lot of, he will introduce himself, but he helps a lot of sports people, but also people in, in business to deal with that and to get people to buy in how, how they say, you know, that they engage intrinsically because they like to engage. And I think this is something where we have something in common with, with his usual clients. But of course, he will give us an input and then it's about exchanging, about asking questions, about having ideas. And uh, so let me introduce to you John, John Island, and I switch over to you now. Ah, wrong direction. <laughs> I'm a box. <laughs> a lot of box. A red box. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so it sounds a bit grand, doesn't it, psychologist? Um, I, I'd like to say a few words about myself um, because what I'm presenting to you today and what I use in my work, then I, um, I've tried it out on myself as well. So hopefully I can bring it with a lot of personal examples and also authenticity. Um, I... Maybe Alex, tell you a little story about myself, uh, which opened up my eyes to um, to what I do and what I'm offering. Um, I grew up in a, a very high performance sporting environment, loved it, um, had a lot of success and enjoyment out of it, and um, was somebody uh, immensely competitive. I mean, if somebody walked past me on the street. I'd have to overtake them and get past them again. Uh, if I went swimming and I'd done 63 lengths and somebody jumped in the pool on my last length and they wanted to overtake me then, I'd have to try and overtake them. So it gives you a bit of a feeling for the, and I enjoyed it. Uh, I got a lot of fun out of it. And I had, um, years later, I come from the northwest of England, uh, Liverpool, Manchester area. I've been living and working from Germany for the last 30 years. I, most of my work is, is international. But I, um, when I moved over to Germany, I got into cross-country skiing and uh, couldn't really ski. I was very fit, but I thought I'd give it a go. And I'd taken part in several marathons and I, I'd registered for a marathon and was really quite ill. I'd had a man flu. Uh, which, as you well know, is, is a very serious thing. And, um, but I, I, in my attitude then, I'd registered to do this, so I was going to do it. And I headed off. And um, in the first sort of 10, 15 kilometres, I, I started off sort of in the top third of the field and the middle of the field, and then was at the back of the field. I just simply wasn't fit enough to do it. And there was a guy in a snowplow behind me and a couple of other people who kept saying, don't you want to stop? And the inner voice inside of me, whose motto was, we've started, so we'll finish, was very dominant and loud. And there was another sort of quieter voice in the background saying, you're an idiot, stop. And eventually I, I, I did stop. And... On the one side of it, there was relief. And on the other side of it in me was actually a lot of panic because I was in a situation that I'd never been in before. I'd never ever not completed something unless I'd been carried off a rugby pitch. I used to play rugby. Um, 
Unfortunately, the week afterwards, I was working with a very good dear friend of mine who's a coach and a therapist, and I, I was telling him this story. And he said to me, well, if you're interested, you know, we can work on it. So for me to, to, to ask for help in the way I was brought up was also quite a difficult task. But I'll, I'll give it a go. I'm curious. And I worked with Thomas for about 18 months. And, and I learned more about myself and my emotional system and structure that I grew up with. And what came out of the marathon and this journey was I, I realized, you know, I had a choice and I have choices, which I didn't think I had before. Um, and this event in my life made me more and more curious. Um, so I went on developing myself. Um, I did quite an extensive training as a, a coach for, for personality and people. And then after that went on and, and trained as a therapist. Um, not to work as a therapist, but just to add to my, to my skill set. Um, and really enjoy and love it in terms of, of helping people here, working with people um, for me, which is uh, to give personal insight um, and to help people unfold their potential. Okay. Um, as Carola said, I, I work in business uh, with leaders in organizations, um, helping them on their own leadership behaviors, habits, I accompany teams over a longer period of time to support them in developing the culture in their team that they want and how that also um, affects an organization in terms of, of developing a culture which brings the best out of each other. Okay? Um, and I work in, in, have worked in sport, uh, do work in sport. I worked in uh, motorsport, in professional basketball, professional rugby, um, work with a, a swimmer. Um, and at the moment, I, I'm working with some um, football coaches um, as well. And I really like the comparison between sport and business, because um, I think there's a lot of pressure in sport um, at three o'clock when the game starts or the event starts. Um, I might have the skills, I might have everything I need, but emotionally, am I in a good place to actually bring it here and now um, when it's wanted? And I think that's, we've talked about a lot of parallels as well with the world of arts. If at seven o'clock this evening, you've got a performance, you've practiced, you've trained, you're in a great place with what you're gonna do, emotionally, are you there so that you can bring your best, okay? Um, and what I'm going to introduce you to today is the background and, um, and some of the fundamentals as to how we humans work, we tick, um, and, and how this uh, affects the way we behave, okay? At that point, any, any questions? doesn't look like it, no. <laughs> okay, just give it a moment. There's, yeah. there's another point. Um, I, I'm the only, I think, original English speaker. Um, so if you have it, I mean, I would like the session to be interactive. So if you've got any questions, stop me and ask, right? And if there's something I say which you don't understand, then ask and I'll explain it differently or bring an example to help you. For me, it's important. It's about a common understanding. And, you know, my principle coming from sport is, you know, we start together, we finish together. So, so please do stop and ask. Okay. Good. Thank you. All right. Let's so happy to share. Yeah. Got a few slides to support. Right. Okay. Um, so the title here, um, it's how we tick, you know, it, it's a, an English saying, you know, how, how we function, all right? It's, but I, I like a simple language so that it's accessible to people, okay? Um, <clears throat> in reflections on the operating system of humans, um, 
it doesn't matter where we come from, what we look like, how old we are, um, we all have the same operating system, right? Pick anybody in the world, we all function, tick the same, we have the same inside of us. Um, but the experiences of life have programmed us differently, right? And um, is there a question in the chat? I, I'm just looking at Let's just have a look. No, it's just hello. Okay, okay, great, okay. <laughs> From before. Sorry, yeah, that, that was great, you know. I'm pretty relaxed. I've been, I need to keep looking at the camera. Girl, this time I tend to look at the screen. And if I look down, um, then um, I'm looking at my notes, just making sure I've said everything. Okay. Um, yeah, so no matter where we come from, what we look like, how old we are, we've all got this same system and it's programmed differently. And I'd like to just give you now a picture. Um, just to, to show you really the, the complexity of, of us, right? It's not of people, but of us, okay? Next one, right? So part of my work is I, um, I do seminars and workshops on the topic of emotional intelligence, um, which is emotional intelligence for me, i.e. the understanding of ourselves, it's all learned. I actually don't like the term emotional intelligence because like intelligence IQ <clears throat> sounds like it's some genetic thing. It, it's not, it, it's learned, right? Some of us, depending upon the environment we grew up in, the system we grew in, are blessed with the skills around being able to express, feel, understand emotions. Unlike myself, I wasn't, um, it was something that I, I decided to learn. Um, this picture here is the top of the picture, you know, where I've got private, I've got work, I've got hobbies, is, is what we experience in life. These are our, our life experiences, our interactions, maybe like what we see, our daily routine. Now, below that, in the black writing, are the emotions, feelings, the impulses we have. Um, the physical changes in our body that the emotions and the feelings generate. And below that, in the green writing, it, it is, is our biography, I call it. Um, so <clears throat> from the way we, we grow up, um, and in the first, I, I work with certain schools of therapy, one of them is Harkomi, and there they say, and research shows, in the first 14 years of life, because of, depending upon the system we grow up in, we develop a lot of aspects of our character and of our personality to ensure we get what we need. That's love, attention, food, encouragement. Um, it's, yeah. Uh, so... And this is, 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 is what we all carry with us. Uh, this is not to say, and I'll, I'll say it now, uh, that with insight, with time, and sometimes with support, that we can work on this and we can develop ourselves. And this is why the story of the marathon from the beginning, for me, I think, is a, for me personally, is a nice example as to where, for instance, in the first 14 years of my life, I grew up in a at school and at home in a highly competitive, as in uh, performance orientated environment. And you could say the, the performing, the performance had me. And what I learned uh, was then to change that to, I have performance, but I bring it when I want to. It doesn't have to be in everything I do, just as a, again, as a personal example, okay? Um, any any questions to this picture? Not so far. Okay. Below, 
Uh, are we going to send people the slides? Yeah. Okay, if great. You, if you share them, yes. Yeah, no, I'm happy with that. Um, I won't go into too much detail now, um, but these are the competencies of, of emotional intelligence. And on the left, um, when I'm working with myself, um, then, uh, and I'll pick this up later, uh, an important skill is, is the self-awareness consciousness and I use mindfulness a lot in terms of, of self-care. Um, the fact that we have a choice, um, I call it uh, self-regulation. Let's say something happens to me just before a meeting and puts me in a bad mood. If I'm aware of that, then I can change it, right? Um, so that's the, the awareness, the refocusing and the leading yourself, again, the example I gave from the marathon of the two voices, you like one on each shoulder, um, the one I knew well, saying you've started so you'll finish, and the rather quieter voice on my other shoulder saying, you're an idiot, stop, okay? And my performance voice was leading me, and, and one of the, the skills of, of, of emotional intelligence is, is how we lead ourselves and lead these voices. Okay? Good. Next one. So, just to keep it simple, two people meeting here, and we've got the, uh, the two pictures with the um, underneath the people. It, it just gives you an image of as I've said here, not as simple as we often think, right? Um, and we experience it. You know, we have what's called the halo effect. You meet somebody and you, there's a sort of a, a magnetism, an understanding, a closeness that happens quickly, right? And often there's something in our biographies there. And on the other extreme, you know, we have situations where we meet somebody and we change and our attitude to the person changes and it's not as easy right and um and and often right and i'm sorry to have to say this to you but it's not to do with them sorry them it's to do with me right um it's something and i'll go on to this in a minute where there's something about them that has has triggered us okay um, and um, so I'll talk later about this topic of, of self-reflection and honesty. Um, but this, this picture, um, I hope, gets across the, the reality of, of people meeting and the complexity of people meeting, which we automatically deal with. Yeah? Um, yeah. any, any questions to that? Okay, good, next one. Right, so I, I'm going to focus, um, uh, I love this, on the picture on the left, the brain. All right, and it, it, it's it's important the brain is there to and it says in the orange at the top to ensure that we survive both physically and emotionally right um it has a very very important function one of the the downsides of this is that it tends to drive us to see risk and problems first right because if we see them then we can protect ourselves. And um, I think it, it, it's at this point, I'll say it's, it's an important muscle to develop over time to be able to get that balance, to be able to see the positive as well, right? But that the brain doesn't automatically um, actually lead us there, okay? Um, I'll just go through the picture in the, uh, in the different colors um, and then I'm going to give you some, some examples of how this works. 
So starting with the red bit, the brain stem, um, this makes sure that the, the body, the human motor runs, you know, the heart's pumping, the lungs, the nervous system, make sure that, that that's all working. The green bit around it, we put a lot of focus on this, is the, is the limbic system. And I, I like to call this the emotional memory. Uh, because that's what it is. That's what its purpose and function is. And um, this starts gathering and saving emotional experiences actually just before, usually two or three weeks before we're born, before the baby comes to the world. And with time and with experience that we make, both the good and the bad emotional experiences are saved here. And the little green eye at the front, the amygdala, is the fight or flight button. And um, this is activated when our limbic system perceives there's danger. Okay. In days gone by, this would be the dinosaurs running through the um, jungle um, and uh, maybe a local tribe making noise and, and coming to attack us. Um, in this day and age, it, it's a lot more for most of us, certainly, is the perception of, of emotional danger, emotional difficulty. Okay. The, the black bit, right, the, the cortex, and we're just focusing here on the bit at the front where the arrows are, is, is where our do actions say our behaviours come out. Okay. And, and years ago, um, the research, the brain research, thought, well, if we understand this black bit of the cortex, we'll understand people. But as, as brain research went on, um, what we learned was that emotions drive behaviours. Okay? So in a situation then that we go into, I'm going to bring some practical examples, the Emotional memory is, is scanning the situation, is looking around. It's not a very fine mechanism. Um, it's quite sort of quick and dirty. There's a quick scan. Oh, there's a bit of danger. Um, and that drives our behavior. Okay. Um, and this signal is sent across uh, from the limbic system um, to the cortex, which, which drives our, our behaviors. Okay. Um, yeah, but, sorry, one questions? question. Yeah, great. Thank you. <laughs> At last. Is I it an hope... easy question? Uh, I hope so. Yeah, it... Me too. Okay, go on, Yusufa. Uh, so I have a question about uh, that cortex development. I was uh, reading and learning about how the frontal cortex is mostly undeveloped with people because of all the traumas and uh, emotional problems until the 14th age so mm -hmm. where is actually like physically um, problem in the cortex or in the limbic system in the limbic what's system. happening in the limbic system so what's happening there okay. um maybe if i can have i'll give you a couple of examples and then i'll come back to your question okay let me keep it at okay. a slightly simple level, and then I'll come back to here the uh, the role of uh, more of trauma. Uh, can I have a picture back? Yes, of course. Okay. There we go. Thanks. Right. So, um, the first example, which one which I'm sure you'll all know, is you walk into a room of people that you've never met before, and you either decide to go across and talk to somebody or you decide to stand on your own in the corner, okay? Often unreflected, right? Now, if we stand in the corner, what we've learned in our limbic system is um, I'm safest when I'm on my own, okay? So I'll stay there and I'll maybe wait till somebody comes to me or I'll actually just simply be quite happy being on my own because my emotional system is saying that's where we're safe. That's what I've learned. Okay. Um, 
I may go across and um, talk to one or two people who are standing, sitting there having a cup of coffee. And what my limbic system has done has actually perceived something about these people related to a past experience where they look like somebody that I can be safe with. All right. So I might go across because they look like X or Y in my life. Actually, they may be very, very different. Okay. But this is the work of our limbic system. Okay. Um, I'll give another couple um, of, of examples. Um, I had um, some years ago, uh, I was doing a seminar and there was a delegate, uh, a man, middle-aged man, who looked like my uncle Frank, right? So I noticed in the first half an hour of this seminar, I was basically just talking to him because my limbic system had said, wow, that's great. Uncle Frank is there, right? And I, I, I was even surprised in the coffee break when I talked to him and I told him this, that he didn't speak with a similar Northern English accent as I did, okay? But that was how my limbic system emotional memory was, was steering me, okay? And for me in working with groups, you know, this is important to, to be aware of how my system is perceiving different people, right? In order to be able to accept people and to see them. Um, another example um, from a, um, again, uh, from a, a seminar, I, it was a two-part seminar. And in the first three days, there was a guy in the group uh, who kept sort of poking me in the ribs. If I'd say something, he'd question me or he'd try and prove me wrong. So there was a, a growing tension, which I was aware of. And I thought, well, it, it was okay. I, I'm pretty sensitive to these things. I thought, I'll, I'll let it go for now. But in the second module, if this continues, then uh, I'll have a chat with him. And um, I did this input at the beginning of the second module. And in the break, he came across to me with a big smile on his face and said, uh, my old statistics professor, you remind me of my uh, statistics professor and we had a really bad relationship, right? And I provoked, activated this in him, right? And this was why he was projecting his feelings to me. His limbic system said, there's your professor, you need to be careful. But as soon as he'd realized I'm not, and he'd realized that, we, we got on great. He even actually um, involved me in, in some work when he left the company. But we, we met at a different level as a result of that. Okay. Um, I've got one more example, which I'll, I'll, give, I'll, I'll come back to your question now. So traumas, um, also from my own experience, are, are saved in our emotional memory um, and ensure that we have a, a highly developed protective system. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to keep it fairly general without going into, uh, into detail, but often these traumas, depending upon, and I think there's different levels and different types of trauma, um, ensure that we develop an emotionally driven system of emotional protection so that if we are triggered, I'll talk about the triggers in a minute on the right, um, then our protective system comes up. Or it might mean that, um, for instance, um, just see, but that we, we actually go through life with our wall up protecting ourselves. Okay. Have I gone some way there to be able to answer your question? Uh, thank you. I was, um, yeah, okay. I, for now, I was 
only knew about the frontal cortex in general, and I didn't know about this limbic system and how are they functioning uh, together. But okay, I understand uh, what you are saying. So, I mean, let's take it one step further. You know, I realize that I've got a trauma. Um, then um, thinking about it won't solve it, right? which is in the, I'm touching my head here because I'm, I'm going to the prefrontal to the cortex. Um, but what we need to do in working with a trauma is to go to the emotional memory, the limbic system, and to be able to work with the emotions um, that this trauma has brought, which has developed the um, protective system. Right? So we go, we work with, we understand um, insights as to the, the feelings around the trauma, what it does. Um, and in my words, we, we find some peace there, which enables our protective system to very, very slowly reduce its work. Okay. Um, this is something which uh, I think needs the time investment um, and personally, uh, also from my own experience here, is um, in order to really uh, work with, get to the bottom, to heal a trauma, then um, some professional support, support is, uh, is helpful, comma, necessary. Okay. You all right with that? Yes, I am. I Thank you. Note. I got the note. All right, thank you. I've got one more example I'd like to uh, to bring in. Um, but any other questions or thoughts at this point? Okay. Hello. Yes. Okay. Wait, I can make myself visible also. You hear me? Yeah, we can. Hi. Um, yeah, it's um, not so much of a question. It's just something like um, which which is a bit um, triggering for me, and I wanted to share it. Is this? I feel like um, often in connection with um, these. Um, I'm I'm really don't like the language that you're using. This idea of us as an operating system and. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and this oversimplifications of the neurological and mm -hmm. um, like on the limbical, it's like this, oh yeah, we have this limbic system, which then like, mm -hmm. if you were know to someone, it's, it's just such an oversimplification that it's really like hard for me to listen to it. Because every time you're telling me like, oh yeah, then your limbic system tells you this and that's why you do this. And that's mm -hmm. this part of your brain is like, completely developed to act, make you act like this. I'm just like, there is... If, from the informations that I actually have from neuroscientists, they they usually end their lectures with like, yeah, but actually we basically don't understand 90% of things. And these are very rough models and um, and we're lacking research funds and things. So mm -hmm. when I'm hearing this, it, it, it puts you in a direction of like neuro-linguistic programming and just kind of manipulative psychological mm -hmm. sports for me, which um, I'm which go i don't know which which i wanted to like uh, that's without great. that yeah it's <laughs> yeah, good. good thank you i appreciate you saying that bringing it up um, greg i mean i in, in my work I, I like to try and keep it simple so that it invites people to understand it um and that if you you take some time a little bit of a reflection and you're aware of this it's accessible to people um this is uh, really uh, my mission i'm trying to make emotions feelings the limbic system the way we work um as simple as possible so that people can feel that they've got access to it and my apologies if it's a bit too simple um I um, I I can recommend, and I'll I'll give uh, Carol. There's a really good book, uh, and it's called Brain. The Brain. I forgot the name of the author, 
um, but he has uh, he comes from the uh, uh, neurological background and he's, he's written a fantastic book in every man's language which explains a lot about the brain and how it works and he is also in this pursuit of how can I make this more accessible to people okay I appreciate that it's um, it maybe in the lightness of it doesn't get across sometimes the heaviness of the feelings that are involved right but I'm, I'm more than aware of that okay anything else you'd like to say or add yeah um I think it's less about like the brevity of it that it's like oh but it's so touching me and it cannot be so simple but it's mm -hmm. more like really the this pop psychology where I'm feel like I'm getting things explained which are quite like mm -hmm. I don't know maybe you will get there and I also I get the point of mm -hmm. like of making it accessible I think that's like mm -hmm. very valuable um I think I just don't don't like it if that everything needs to be somehow like um like this like psychological simplification somehow need to be um justified through our neurological system when it's at the moment like just very very basic processes somehow that um <laughs> that we, we we all are familiar with and like and which can really not be boiled down to 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 neurological functions i think um because if you actually look at like ct scans and things it's way more complex than this and um and yeah i think i don't know in my from what i read the research of it is just really minimal but um yeah that's that was more my point with it yeah I mean, I, I'm. I think I'm. I'm talking about the the consequences of that complexity and how it affects our our feelings and our behaviour. Um, and I think that for me and my work, in fact, that's what we've got access to. Um, I said to myself, you know, if I react in a certain way in certain situations, I don't need a brain scan to understand it. Uh, what I need is um, the self awareness the self-honesty, the mindfulness to realize, oh, hang on a minute, something's changing my body here. That's affecting what I'm going to say, what I've said, what I want to say. Um, and that's really the, the level where I work um, in, in working with myself and supporting others um, in, their, uh, in their behaviors, their attitudes, and where the emotions come from. Right, let me... That aligns very much. I'm sorry. Thank you for, no, for your you. answers. Yeah. No, it's important. I say I welcome, welcome everything, every comment, every thought, every perception here that we can openly talk about it just as we are doing. Um, it's, um, let me, um, just give me a moment. Yeah, I'll, let me give you um, another, I'll go back to a, an actual example which I think just builds on, on, on what I've said. Um, I was working with um, a French lady who was working up in the, the north of Germany in a company, um, Helena, and, and we worked together for a couple of years. And uh, she got a very, very good promotion in the company, and, and I had a, a session with her. And we were sitting down and I said, you know, how's it going? How's the new job? How are you getting on with your boss? Um, you know, how are you? And, and she was saying, yeah, no, I'm doing well. My boss is great. Um, we take time. We're getting to know and to understand each other. Um, and she said, yeah, I've got a really good team. Um, and I've got a team workshop was to talk about how we're going to work together, our collaboration and, and this. And I could hear the, the, the question in the background that, that, that was, was coming. And she, um, she said to me, the, the big, you know, but, 
I've got one guy in my team. Uh, we're just not coming together. We're not clicking. I get the feeling, you know, he says something and it shoots past me. I say something and, you know, there's, there's something that's really not working well here and I'd like to talk about it. And I would say, you know, so, well, well, tell me a bit more about it. And um, she was chatting away and then I asked her the question, um, who does he remind you of? And she thought for a moment, and then a big smile came across her face. And she laughed and she nodded. And she had been married, had been divorced, and, and shortly after a divorce, she'd had this wild and fantastic relationship with a guy who was tall and slim. She was a bit shorter and stocky. And um, the ex boyfriend had this habit of looking down on her and cocking his head to one side, right? Now, our friend in the leadership team, you probably worked it out, was tall, was slim, walked into the room. They were both looking forward to seeing each other. He walked in, he looked down at Helena, cocked his head to one side and said, hello, I'm pleased to meet you. And Elena's limbic system, the emotional memory, went on an alarm here and said, um, Oof, we need to protect ourselves. Right? So she withdrew emotionally and her defense mechanism came up. Right? And Lars was the name of the other guy. And Lars, his system sensed this. And so at an subconscious level in this meeting, his emotional safety system came into play. So you had two people grown up standing in the room talking and both at an emotional level in a defensive mode. Right. And so what happened was Helena realized this. She realized that Lars was not the ex-boyfriend and that she was safe. And all she did was go into future meetings in this non-defensive open attitude, which she had. His system sensed this. He relaxed and the quality of communication and collaboration improved. Okay. Um, and I, I, again, I think this is a lovely example of the way that our, our limbic system supports us, importantly supports us, and with a level of, of self-awareness, we can become aware of these mechanisms and these impulses and how uh, we react differently to, to different people. Okay. Any any thoughts or, or questions to that example? Okay. Um, we just make that first one. So what I want to do now on the picture of the brain on the left where the green arrow is going from the emotional memory across to the prefrontal cortex. I'd like to, to move to the picture on the right, which are the automatic reactions. And what happens, and I, I'm taking here uh, a couple of difficult examples, ones that are problems. We're also, you know, we have, very positive automatic reactions uh, when we meet somebody um, and they trigger a really good and open um, communication and, and relationship, friendship with somebody. But this is the way the, the mechanism works. Right? So something, the red dot, the trigger, something triggers us. Okay? Um, could be 
what somebody says, the way they say it, um, and our system perceives the, the difficulty, the danger. At that point, right, the blue arrows that go down, first of all, something changes inside our body, right? We have different reactions. Now, with, with awareness, then, for instance, my reaction is it, it comes from the, if you can imagine, from my belt of my trousers, like a volcano up through my stomach, my chest, and my reaction comes out. And in the past, it, it just happened like that. Okay, if I was triggered. And so I'd head off up the motorway. And um, for me, in, in some situations, I would be louder. I would class myself as a bit more aggressive. And in some situations, it would generate a, a withdrawal. Okay, But both of those behaviours are forms of protection. And, and, and this protection is important. Okay, um, <clears throat> Often, what I'd say here, these protective mechanisms develop early on in life, and they keep going because we never tell them to do anything differently. Right? So what we can do is, and this is, is through, this is where self-awareness, self-honesty, and, and a good feeling for your body and the changes in your body help you. Somebody says something and it triggers and you're aware of, of that feeling, okay? And you have what I've got here in green, the window of opportunity where I can take a deep breath and I can, I can stop the automatic reaction, right? And this gives me the choice. I can still go on and be Mr. Angry if I want or... I can actually decide to go a different route. Okay, you might say, oh, hang on a minute. That's, that's triggered me a bit. Just give me a second. I need to, uh, to just sort myself. And then I can come with a different, better, emotionally nicer, more collaborative reaction. Okay. Um, but as I say, the, the basis for this and for having this choice um, is, is a a sense of, of self-awareness, a sense for what's happening in the body, right? Um, and often if you, you get to the point you're in the brain, you're thinking about it, um, then you've missed that, that moment in the awareness in the body. Okay? Good. Any, any questions there? Any thoughts? Um, I mean, I, just just picking up the um, maybe a couple more examples around the emotional memory and triggers. Um, a simple example which I like um, is is the word feedback, um, and I'm often brought into situations with with teams that are collaborating and working together. And people say, oh, we need a, a really good feedback culture here. We need to be open and honest with each other. And this will be a foundation for the way that we can collaborate and develop. Um, and, and I mean, you can think to yourselves or sense for yourselves what that word means for you. But here, often this is anchored in our limbic system emotional memory in the way we experience feedback when we were growing up right and you know if you you talk to some people it was painful it was very negative with others they thought it was really helpful they were grateful in a good environment so in a, in a team when you you bring in this word um it will automatically evoke different feelings, different emotional states to people. 
in people. And this is why um, it's so helpful in a team to, to talk openly about this and to say, okay, great, yeah, this sounds fantastic. But let's just take a moment, you know, what are your experiences with this word? You know, when we, we talk about feedback, um, what, what, does, what emotions, pictures, impulses come up? Um, and if we're going to have an open conversation about it and understand where people are coming from, then we can start to, to talk about how we can actually deal um, with a, a culture where we exchange our perspectives in order to help and develop each other. Um, we can decide how, how, we, how we want to go about it. So it's emotionally good and safe for everybody. Um, and then interesting, in a couple of, uh, I changed my language in, in what I just said, um, where I often talk about an exchange of perspectives instead of using the word feedback. Um, if you like, I'm, I'm rebranding the principle around feedback by, uh, by using the words exchange of perspectives. And that is, it gets a lot of, of, of positive resonance. Okay. Um, the word collaboration, um, depending upon, again, our biographies and the environment we grow it, grew up in around it, um, evokes different emotional feelings and images. Uh, so if, for me, playing a team sport for 20 years, um, then collaboration is, is well, I think, fantastic, great. Uh, for some people who didn't experience it or maybe have bad experiences with it, then it's actually quite a difficult topic. And they go, oh, hang on a minute, let's just be careful. I need to be, I need to be careful here. So again, this is the value of the exchange. Um, now and again, I, I write speeches for people, um, and um, which I really enjoy. And I really enjoy as well is, you know, is choosing the words uh, which will help the audience of the, uh, of the person who's holding the speech, um, how it will be more integrating, emotionally inviting for people. Obviously, you can't do it for everybody because everybody's got these different emotional experiences, but with some care and some thought, um, then I can, I can choose words and phrases which help people to relax um, and to listen better. So this is, again, on a practical level, building upon the foundation of, of this topic of, of how we tick. Yeah. I'm looking down at my notes to see if there's anything that I've missed out. That's about it. So I'm going to shut up <laughs> right, and uh, ask you what you think, any thoughts, questions. I'm also curious, maybe as well, as to hear what your first thoughts are that, that might help you in, in your job or in your collaboration in what you do. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for the lecture. I have uh, one uh, maybe general question. It's uh, about the, the title is how to catch the spirit, uh, human spirit. So you would say that actually this mechanism that you explained, um, that that's what, what would be in the box of the human spirit or just the mechanism of the spirit. I'm just curious, what is your um, position on that? You want to say something? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I may, I mean, you know, I asked John, I think, I think that comes a bit where, why I asked him, because it's actually exactly on this thing we have, um, when we are working in the arts, usually what we, what we reach, I mean, we could say tackle, but tackle is very aggressive as a word in English. But, <laughs> but we, we work, uh, we work in the, on the limbic system. That's what we reach. We mm. reach the intuitive. 
And uh, what I observe is that we are not uh, usually not 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 looking into depth what the limbic system can do, how it is connected to our frontal cortex, and when it touches, like you say, traumas, but also good experiences. So the question for me is, um, and that's that's why why I the question for me is how do we un unpack actually creativity? Because you have two ways to um, unpack creativity. The one is you need to survive and you need to find a solution. So you find a, a new invented solution for something that saves your life. That's one part of creativity. Or the other one is that you learn to create safe spaces for yourself and for the audience. I mean, we're talking here performing arts. Um, so the audience can unpack their limbic system and feel good with it. And I think that's something which is really, really important to, to consider when you're creating something completely new, mm -hmm. which is the original thought of doing a new interpretation of opera. And I know it's sometimes difficult to say, okay, I create something intuitively and now I need to put it from my own limbic system intuitively to my frontal cortex so I can explain it. And I don't think we have to go there that we need to explain it, but we need to be aware that everyone has their own um, personality that's underneath, you know, the first slide, what you bring with your, with your biography, then how your limbic system is activated in a safe way, in a, in a kind way, in a, in an opening way mm -hmm. and how you then uh, bring it to the frontal cortex because the people that are sitting there first they we, we make them walk around we make them look watching something which is still very cognitive and then it goes into the limbic system and then it gets deeper and deeper because that's how we how we how we plan to to guide them through and so i think that's where the, where, that's where where we where, where I would like us to discuss a bit more or to think about it and to in, a, in order to be able to do that we need some words and we need some concepts we agree on and that's actually why I asked for the simple for, for the simple operating mm -hmm. system and I liked it because it, of course it's provocative because mm -hmm. I also don't agree at all that we have a uh, a computer operating system you know that we can mm -hmm. that that we can just Let's handle this and everything is fine. If, if life would be so easy, I think we wouldn't have so many conflicts in the world. Yeah, okay, but we do have a mechanism. So it's not, uh, I mean, we, we, we know something about it. So that's it. Mm -hmm. But we should have, uh, yeah, okay. If I can add something there as well, it's maybe more in the, again, my perception here and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when you're in um, the process of, of creating something, um, for me is how the level of emotional security uh, that is in the group um, enables people to open up and to bring that creativity. You know, I in my work a lot with teams, um, one of the first things that I talk about and work on with people is um, emotional security. What I'm talking about is here, how safe does the limbic system, the emotional memory of each person feel in this team and, and what do we need in order to, to grow that emotional safety? It, it's by no means a switch. Some people we could add to the word of trust, um, but it's how do we, if we discuss it openly, we talk again about our vulnerability, our difficulties, what we enjoy, but we get that openness of conversation and we're, we're building a foundation uh, which we can enables people to, to open up and to bring ideas. That's a creational process and I think we should also consider, you know, one thing is, um, is what we are doing an expression of ourselves and we don't mm. care how it is perceived? Or are we also trying to express ourselves, which is the basis of, of, mm. of uh, artistic expression, mm. 
and also translated into narratives that are understood by mm. the audience. And maybe where do we draw mm. the line? No, mm. but this would be from black to white, from white to black, or from, yeah, from white to colored or whatsoever. What, well, anyway, enough of us. What else? Does that go somewhere you see for to answering your question? Uh, yes, I, yes, I think so. I have a, an additional question. You mentioned uh, uh, creating safe space for myself, but also for the audience. So uh, we are actually trying to think about how the audience will feel, or we are trying to model our art in a direction so the audience feels in a certain way. Because if we do that, it means that, uh, yeah, we are creating the art, uh, how, uh, how to say, yeah, maybe we are limiting the art, so because we cannot influence how people are going to feel. We can maybe, um, um, looks like I should, uh, uh, we can uh, assume. We can assume, yes, what people might feel or how they might react. Of course, we are not, we don't want anybody to feel uh, uh, super bad, but uh, maybe that safe space is uh, a limiting space in a kind, some way. Like uh, you're walking on eggs all the time. I think we need to be aware of that. Yes, I agree. We, we, that, that's what art is, you know. And performing arts means uh, you are you are live creating something in the head of the of the audience. And the question is just do you do do you just want to do it around yourself, and the audience can has the choice to stay or leave, or do you take them into consideration? You know, I I would not go to there that we can draw their pictures. But of course not. You know, that's not. You cannot do that, and uh, also that then you go the, the 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 extreme would be that we are trying to manipulate them. That's I, I I think that's the only thing where we all agree. But being aware, especially if you if you do like you know my background is theater. That's where I come from. You know, and in theater, you you tell stories of development, and so you're creating something um, an experience in the head of the audience. And you're always very, very aware that emotions drive behavior and not the other way around. And um, so it's it's more a philosophical exchange, I would say. But Sarah, you wanted to to join in. No, oh, yeah, you basically just said what what I what I wanted to add that um, uh, that I think every well, art art is always some sort of manipulation and i wouldn't i wouldn't avoid that word and i wouldn't be afraid of it you know because to direct is to manipulate you know to arrange something is to manipulate so and uh i mean we as a society maybe uh maybe put some uh uh some bad meaning some bad moral category into it but it's not uh, the word as it is I mean we are you know we are shaping some kinds of experiences and of course we you never have you can never know uh, and which is good that's why things are exciting right uh, you never know to what extent you can the message will be received and what will go on in people's heads if you knew if we knew that then poetry wouldn't exist so uh, so I think the whole the whole playfulness and catch is actually the interplay, the exchange of your of your kind of uh, very intuitive uh, expression to the outside, and then what is received, and something totally totally new can come out of it. So that would be my comment. Can I, I pick up on what you're saying? I, I really like. It. I was coming back. Was it? Greg, was it you that was asked the question saying I was too simple? Um, was it, I think yeah. it was. Yeah, no, it was, was uh, Gregor. Well, yeah, you, Gregor, you brought in the word manipulating. I just made a note to come back to it. I think it's good that we bring this word into the discussion. And I think, Sarah, what you were saying, I think there's influencing is another word 
that belongs in this category and also creating. So I, I think, you know, it, it's like anything, you know, in the right hands, a hammer can produce a sculpture, can create a house and in the hands of somebody else, you know, can be used as a murder weapon. Um, and I think this is the same that we're talking about, you know, Gregor brought in the topic of, of NLP, Neuro Linguistic Program, which I, I don't like because I think there is a very manipulative aspect around that in the way it's presented. But this, as I say, is my experience. The, the, the point I want to bring out is if I just stand with somebody in a room, we're influencing each other just simply by the way we look, smell, um, speak, you know, we're activating each other's limbic system. It, it's happening all the time around us. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, well, I think that um, that if we as a group do art with um, <clears throat> or I mean, if our limbic system, in my limbic system, and each of who is presenting the art to people is in peace and in, in mm -hmm. belief in what we are doing and how do we want to, to bring this to these people, I think it doesn't matter what we do and how we do, but the people are going to perceive it on the right way. Because first of all, we are doing it, we are doing something new. So anyhow, we are going to do something what people are not used to perceive, or they are not going to perceive classical opera, but they are going to perceive something completely new. So it means it's going to be triggering in some way already. And, but I think that if we as a, if the most important is that we as a group find, um, yeah, the way of performing that and the work that each of us is in peace and in the right connection out of the, this limbic system, then also people doesn't matter actually, because the energy that we are going to bring, it's going to be the right one. Excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, and just again, I, I was thinking about you know people are coming to watch it because they want to, right? You know they they come with curiosity. So there's something that you've done and the way you've presented yourselves that has activated that curiosity in people. Um, and they, they they want to. They're curious to see, hear, experience what you're offering. Again, that's my very much my my layman's view my simple view on, uh, on that. Yeah, yeah well, what, I, what I think is that um, just adding to that is if we are in peace and activated. Mm. Um, if we're just in peace, it's, it's very calm. But we need this activation so curiosity can come in too. And and uh, and I mean that very very kind. So what 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 is it? You know what is it that that makes it interesting, in the sense of not just resting, but also resting, going a step, maybe resting, maybe not resting, and things like that. You know, and, and it's just I, th I think it's just this awareness that uh, especially our diversity has such a big value. This everyone thinks different. The backgrounds, the backgrounds uh, are somehow connecting those three people, and uh, then um, our upbringing connects maybe those people because it's a culture of upbringing in each country that is different. Uh, then maybe you have narratives about the other two countries in your in your society in your culture. Mm -hmm that I'm meeting. And I think there we have such a treasure and such such a value um, that addressing that with curiosity and addressing that, that also sometimes if I have some, oh, this is too quick or this is too, too not organized or something like this, or this is too strict. If you can handle that and choose the other way around, you know, not going direct that ah, I need it, I need to have this sorted now. But 
I decide, okay, I would need this, but mm. maybe this person has a reason that brings it up the other way. Mm. And the curiosity comes in. I think mm. we can even, um, I don't know, harvest the treasure. Access. Access, yeah. Word. I mean, I can, again, a personal example here. My father, I grew up with a very, very strong prejudice against the French, right? Um, my father wouldn't buy a French car. My apologies for anybody here with French uh, descendants or, or whatever. Um, but because of that, then it influenced my perception. So I then I, I played rugby against a few uh, French teams and, and automatically, because of my upbringing, I was looking for confirmation to my father's prejudices, right? And I found them because I looked for them, right? They're idiots, right? You know, they always complain, you know, always moaning. And um, plus a few other things, which I won't repeat. But, um, and then I got to know people and I thought, shit, he's wrong. You know, they're really nice. But we actually have a lot in common, okay? But it was that change in my perception which opened up the door to, to be curious, to accept and, and to feel emotionally safe with, with French people. And, you know, I've even got French friends. I don't say that too loudly, but, but it's that change in perception, questioning our own perception sometimes um, of the prejudice, prejudices that we carry around. And that opens up, I think, an immense field of, of valuing diversity and differences. Mm -hmm. Vasco, you have been so quiet. <laughs> Let's have uh, an additional we don't you. comment. We don't hear you, Vasco. Unmute yourself. Oh. We don't hear you. You're mute, muted. Yeah, I'm just, uh, yeah, it's, I find it interesting. Uh, as we bring these uh, things uh, on and uh, talk about this awareness, of different things as performance, audience, or personal things. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with what Sarah said about uh, that we are as artists. How do how are we? We are so always kind of influencing, manipulating, uh, and uh, should be in a way aware of our audience in a way. Uh, I mean, I, I think maybe we can be even more successful in our, let's say, manipulation. Um, but art uh, in general, I mean, would not, should, but I think we all agree also on this, but it, it's just good to have these thoughts maybe around and uh, think about them. So as in these times, we are, a lot of times we are talking about, you know, health and like everything should be like i mean we are also almost coming to this to have an art for health you know, like to be uh and and like i'm soon i'm doing a lecture about uh, about uh, jazz for example jazz music and in connection with the health and and medical uh i mean world and it's uh, and you could find articles uh, like in, in history that sometimes uh, jazz was like uh, about jazz. They wrote like it, it's like uh, danger for our nervous system and is is disturbing. It's like music that can cause you know uh, almost physical pain to you, pain and to you, and etc. And and these days maybe. The, you will find more maybe articles about like the jazz can be like, you know, calm <laughs> for for the soul and, and so. But but in general, I think this whole uh, whole way it's it's like quite wrong, you know, about when we are when you are thinking about art and uh, you know it's like art should not, uh, uh, in my opinion, of course, should not be in in in, in work of. Or in job of healing, actually. I mean, um, we can have some, you know, sound treatment, etc. You know, but but uh, that's not really when we are speaking about art. I would say art should be, uh, uh, you know, it's maybe not wrong if, if art sometimes also give you pain and, you know, that's something that 
maybe this will uh, push you, you know, into 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 uh, uh, yeah, relieving in in the next step. You will you will you know come to the catharsis and uh, solve something in, in in your or relationships or within yourself. And so I think so. It's this should be a work of art always to kind of uh, reflect uh, the the world we are living in. On the, the inner and astral and you know the, the different views of uh, it, it's kind of reflection I would say of what we are living in and and also it's nice when we can meet in this art you know we can share so we can share this experience and so here we have artists that are kind of we said they're manipulating in a way but on the other sides we have we have uh, experience together you know? like there is there is no concert without an audience I mean, you you always connect somehow and and it's uh, and and it's also not on, i would say on, on not only on this nervous system uh, scientific uh, uh, but uh, i mean it is everything it's always uh, we can bring it to that but it's uh, a lot of i would say on energetic level you know it's it's uh, some kind of so you know some things we always say is have uh, my, you know, and uh, yeah, I, I'm so you know excited, and I don't know really why, you know, and some some tensions is created, and and uh, and uh, if there would be like, if you have a concert and there's just five people in the audience, or you have like 150 people or 500 people, I mean, it, it will affect the 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 experience. You know? it, it, so it's it's not just up to the artist, but it's for this connection. So yeah. I think it's really nice that uh, thank you for your lecture and for bringing you know these topics. Uh, it's important for artists to to talk about. Yeah, definitely. Sarah, thank you. Uh, I just <laughs> I wanted to introduce the topic of catharsis, catharsis but um, <laughs> Vasco then mentioned it. Yeah, uh, I I also agree that um you shouldn't as david bowie puts it you should never play for the gallery right <laughs> so uh, you are aware that the gallery exists of course and but you should never play for it yeah. Yeah. Yosipa. yes uh, i agree with sara and uh, vasco um it, i i find this lecture very interesting and uh, thank you for uh making it possible um but maybe i would uh, take this uh, knowledge uh, for our uh, workshop uh, that is coming before every uh, um, every opera because it will be very intense and a lot of triggers happening so i think that's most important than what will uh, trigger the audience mm -hmm uh but because yeah i don't know even how many people will be there but we know we know it's 15 artists and three mentors so uh maybe this knowledge can help us to uh live through the intense weeks of work and uh, creativity if i can, can I yeah, yeah. <laughs> i think you're spot on for me it's there's two levels why i'm picking up this one is is for you as a team, a group of people creating. You know, how, how can this help you? Um, I think individually, as well as a, a group, a team to, to be aware and to be sensitive of that and um, to talk openly, you know, have time for that. And I think Vasco and Sarah, what you just said as well is, you know, from my very naive perspective upon this is, you know, you take me on a, an emotional journey with what you offer some of which will give me goosebumps some may make me cry and some may frighten me and that's wonderful <laughs> you know but it's you're taking on me a, an, an emotional journey which will also help me discover new perspectives new feelings um and that's why you're there you know and, and that's why i and others come because we actually want that yeah and, and i guess you know the courage to to take people further to discover 
um, it, it's a wonderful opportunity. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And for me, it's just that that one hand, I, I, I really care about this team aspect because uh, one thing, it's it's always good to start mm -hmm. with yourself. And mm -hmm. uh, myself, or ourselves, is, is this team here that will yeah. develop something together and mm -hmm. how we how we go about it and how we honest we are with triggers. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that, um, and, yeah, just again, my, my theater creation thing, um, I know everyone who is a good screenwriter is aware of these things, you mm. know? Good screenwriting and good playwriting mm. is based on that knowledge mm. and, and a, a very clear artistic uh, implementation or application of that. Mm. Because we, yeah, that's just that's just what mm. uh, what plays and mm. films and that, that's why why Netflix produces better better series than uh, usually national national TV stations just of the plot mm. you know sometimes also superficial but what they do really right is they were the first ones to to go beyond the limits of mm. what is okay or not they just mm. tackled. Um, true psychological behavior. They also they also dare to introduce heroes that are not proper heroes, that have those those vulnerable spots, those not so hero heroic spots and so on. And that has to do with that. And that's why I care that we just, if, if it tells us something, it's good. And I hear it does, which I really like. James Bond springs to mind when you say that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's the yeah, and the development <laughs> of between between the old James Bond and the Daniel yeah. Craig who dares to yeah. fall in love yeah. and dares to crack because he falls yeah. in love and this woman dies and all of a sudden the strong guy is not yeah. strong anymore. Yeah. So that that's where I'm talking about, you know, where yeah. yeah. Josipa. Sorry, you just uh, caught me on the sentence that Netflix has better series than the national TV. <laughs> <laughs> me too. I really cannot agree with that. <laughs> yeah. I know. Yeah, well, maybe you have we have great great yes, uh, exactly. series in Croatia. I can. And we're not talking about Croatia. I think we're. T I think j just making a generalization that Netflix is like the top yes. notch thing for screenwriting. Uh, I, I, I really don't I think so. <laughs> no, no, no. But that's not what I said. But they started to introduce heroes that are mm. not just heroes mm. they, that's but, what they did actually and a lot of a lot of others mm. worked on that and especially they did it on uh, maybe in mainstream but really in the history a history of film and tv they are not pioneers i'm sorry <laughs> no no but they, they they have a good reach you know okay yeah what what I'm saying is they talk to much more to much more people to many more people mm -hmm. than independent films usually do because of course you're right you have a, you have always had um, the indie scene that was that was digging deeper and that was doing mm -hmm. a lot of artistic things but they did not reach usually a big audience mm -hmm. and that's what they changed they changed mm -hmm. the tradition and it does not mean that they are top notch that's not where I'm coming from. I, I care to not be interpreted like this. No, no, but uh, I believe that in that uh, reaching out to many people just came to the limitations because now uh, many people are watching and now you can manipulate what they're watching and now there is not uh, quality series and movies anymore. So that was just uh, like a manipulation. Yeah, yeah. Can I come back mm -hmm. to the point? <laughs> I'm going to leave Netflix right up. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, to come back, um, you see, I think you brought in the point around, uh, and this is, is sort of where my focus and perspective on you as a team, right? And how this can help you when you meet. Um, and I, I have a, a wish. Um, pleasure. Uh, Aaron needs to leave. Yeah, yeah so. thank you. Pleasure, Aaron. Thank you. Uh, um, and one of the things my wish is, um, if you feel triggered, you take a moment and ask yourself, "What's this to do with me?" Right. Um, 
I think is, and then afterwards, you can go to the person who's maybe triggering to listen, just so you know that that really triggers me. It's my thing. But if I react strongly, then it's because. Okay. Um, and um, mine is, is, for instance, is, you know, is, is fairness. Uh, it used to be a trigger. Um, I understand why, <clears throat> because I know what it's like to be not treated fairly. Yeah. So if I see something unfair, then I <clears throat> jump up and think, oh, they must feel as bad as I did, right? But my strong reaction was based upon my biography, not on what you said, okay? So the process there is, hang on, let me just take a, oh gosh, that's really hit me, touched me there. Uh, why is that there? Okay because of a certain belief and experience. I clarify myself and I'll go to somebody, we'll call them somebody neutral. It might be Paul and say, listen, Paul, I'm sorry I reacted strongly there. It's, it's to do with me, but just so you know um, that, that that's a bit of a trigger and maybe you can help me with it, but it's not you, it's me. So there's those moments of, of, of self-reflection and self-honesty when you, you realize that, that you're being triggered. Okay. That's me finished. <laughs> Run out worse. <laughs> so, shall I finish that? Please keep Netflix to yourself. <laughs> don't don't mix it up with me. I'm not mm. Netflix, and I'm not mm. fighting for Netflix. Um, I think. Oh, I, think I, I know. Sorry. Sorry if I sounded too harsh, but it was just a very strong sentence for me, and I want yes. to make it clear. And I think, I think you know, common understanding of humor should also be. <laughs> Present. Yeah. Triggered by Netflix. Yeah. It's a nice aspect here of, of, of clarification and openness. This is exactly yeah. it. You know, what you've just done, you see, is great. You know, and it's 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 coming in and, and, and Sarah's supporting. But, you know, it, it's having those moments then to be able just to clarify what's happening. I think that's great. You're starting to do it. Or yeah. You're doing it, you know, which is lovely. Yeah. Well done, you. Yeah, I have my therapist, so. <laughs> I'm sorry? I have my therapist, so that's why I know. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we finish it up with that, actually? Any, it's any a other, very nice any ending. Any questions <laughs> or anything, or can we finish there? Cool. Thank you. So thank you very much. And yeah, John, thank you very much for Pleasure. being with us. We may invite you to... Mm -hmm. to the to the performances actually end of august okay. right. end of september beginning of october Thank in you. very nice places good yeah good. so would you be nice to me <laughs> don't trick me, <laughs> don't trick me. <laughs> i'll be curious yeah, <laughs> to see what emotional journey you take me on <laughs> oh, thank you and i'm looking forward to yeah to, to our work, actually, to incorporating mm. that and using that. And uh, yeah, thank you for this evening. Thank you for this evening. Pleasure. Thank you for this evening. Mm -hmm. And um, thanks for investing your time. Have a great okay. evening. Okay. And if you want, just open the microphones and let's say goodbye together. So, <laughs> yes. Thank you. Have thank a good you. evening. Thank you very thank much. You. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. One picture. One